Julio, I've been obsessed with consciousness. I studied the brain, tried to understand consciousness from the brain. No success like everyone else. You've given the world a new way to think about consciousness, starting with the mind or consciousness and seeing what you need to do then to have structures that can generate that, and you call it integrated information theory. If I were to go with you and, and to believe that, uh, I don't yet, uh, maybe I will, but if I were to go with you, what are the implications for it? What are the implications for consciousness, uh, for reality? There are many. So if one starts for a moment, very briefly, with the theory again, you know, identifying the essential properties, which are that it exists, that it is structured, that it exists in a particular way, that's the information part, that it can be subdivided into pieces, that's the integration part, and it is unique. There is only one that is being had by you right now. And then translate, as the theory does, these axioms into postures, saying what does the physical stuff out there, uh, what does it have to be like in order to generate experience? And we come to this conclusion that an experience, in essence, is a shape. That's the best way to think about that. It is a shape in this extraordinarily large dimensional space, qualia space, which every state is a possible past and future state of a system of mechanisms. And a particular system of mechanisms, if it has the right properties, it will constrain the space in a particular way, in the past, in the future, and that's a shape. Now, it's not like the ordinary shapes all around us, but it's still the best metaphor, because it's going to be this very, very special structure. Technically, it's called a maximally irreducible conceptual structure. Like a shape, it is one, it cannot be broken. A bottle is not a bottle anymore if you break it into. The same for the shapes of consciousness. But it has an immense number of symmetries that can be broken by the shape itself. Now, imagine this shape in some way. Now, imagine I have an instrument, which I call a qualioscope, which is something which we can only do for very, very simple systems right now, but it looks at how they are made of physically. It looks how they constrain the past and the future. It looks if they do generate such a shape or not, and in which kind of qualia space, how big it is. So imagine now this, this instrument called the qualia scope is actually able to be pointed at anything and find out is there a shape there or not, how big it is, and what kind of shape. So we have this instrument, and now here we are in this jungle, you and I talking, and let's imagine me holding this instrument, which is not impossible to build, and pointing it towards the sky. And when pointed towards the sky, I suspect that while it's vast and great, in terms of qualia, there would be essentially nothing there because it's not able to constrain its past and its future in a maximally reducible way. So nothing there. You basically don't get any sound, so to speak, from your detector. And then I point it towards the ground, and in the ground, there may be a little bit, but not much. It buzzes a little bit. It doesn't detect many shapes at all. Then I point it towards the tree, and suddenly I begin, begin to see some interesting sort of line drawing, so to speak. That's what maybe is what's happening with trees. Then I point it towards you. And when I point it toward, let's say, your liver, although it has a huge number of cells in there, maybe each of them forms a very, very small shape, but there is nothing like one big shape of the liver, nothing like that. And then I point it towards your brain. And even there, if I go back in the back of your head, well, there is this gigantic cerebellum with 60 billion neurons. I point it there, well, maybe locally there are little shapes, but there is not a beautiful single shape corresponding to the cerebellum, not much. Then I point it to some parts of your cerebral cortex, and now suddenly there is a big explosion. There is a fantastic, gigantic, immense shape with an immense number of symmetries, which is how, to my qualioscope, your experience looks like. Seen from the outside, but your experience is the shape seen from the inside. I hear this word is, and when you see that shape, that multi-dimensional shape that has an enormous number of, of dimensions or symmetries, are you saying that that shape is my feeling of consciousness, my sense, my inner experience, my phenomenon? personal phenomenology, or that is a, a correlate or relates to it? No, it is. It is an exact identity. It is an exact to be identity. that shape is to have that experience. That can only be had from the inside. You must be that thing. I cannot be you, and you cannot be me. But you can, in principle, see the shape? 
but with a proper instrument, with the proper instrument shape, you yeah, could yeah, yeah. actually describe that shape because, after all, it is a shape, a mathematical structure. You can describe it mathematically okay. if you know the mechanisms. But you being is not describing. Okay. You cannot be what you describe, but you can describe what you are. So to go back to your explorations with your uh, qualioscope, when you pointed at the tree, you saw some lines. That means that the tree is minimally conscious? Well, that's of course is a metaphor, and I have no idea what it is like to be a tree because we haven't measured that. Right. What we suspect is that possible. In principle, it would be. This is the nice thing about it. In principle, you could ex examine anything and ask, is it like to be anything or not? Just like you can ask, is there mass there? Is there charge there? Well, you get an answer. Is there a lot of mass? What kind of mass? A lot of charge? What kind of charge? Much more complicated with consciousness, not just an extensive property, there's a little bit and more, it is a shape. Mm -hmm. So, but you can ask, is there a shape? What kind of shape? And then it's an interesting game to play. Right. What are the real shapes out there? You know, because the big difference here is the shapes we play around with, we know, are shapes that exist for us. I see leaves, I see trees, I see people in my own consciousness. But the shapes we are talking about here, the shape of experience, is the shape that is in and of itself. It doesn't require an observer to exist, it is. While the shapes that I see, leaves, etc., they require me to be seen. There may be no tree, that's my point, in and of itself. Right, right. There sure. is, however, my experience doesn't require an observer to exist. Right. It's intrinsic information, it's not extrinsic information. Now, this shape that can be seen from the outside, a third party could see that shape with the proper technology a billion years from now, whatever, yep. whatever that is. That wouldn't tell you how it feels like to be that, because that would only be when you experience that from the inside. But it would, it would be, if it is identical to that, if, you, if, if the person has that experience, you would always see exactly that same shape. Certainly that, and more, much more than we can say right now. For instance, if ex an experience is a shape, you can make judgments about similarity of shapes. So while I would not be able to be you, I could look at your shapes when you're talking to me right now and my shapes when I'm talking to you with this instrument, mm. and I would expect them to be not that different from mm. each other, mm -hmm. okay? And then I could look at different experiences of mine and see how different is that. And then we look at the shape of an iguana out there on the wall that's generated in the brain of an iguana, it's going to be smaller probably, it's going to be less uh, elegant than yours and mine, but we could say how much smaller is it, how many symmetries does it have, and uh, you know, to what extent does it look a little bit like one of ours and not? You can play around with shapes. Philosophers sense. have uh, characterized consciousness as um, uh, something that, that has no extension and has no place and no place in the physical world, yet you're seeing these shapes in a very particular place. So when you see the qualia uh, 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 shape on my cerebral cortex, does that mean that the, the, the perception, the, the mental experience is located within space? You have to distinguish. The idea here is not that your neurons connect in a certain way form a shape. The, you know, the intricate, in, intricate connectivity of the brain is a matter of marvel. There's no doubt, and it's being studied right now, the so-called connectome. But that is not the shape we're talking about. It is how those neurons connect in a certain way constrain their past and their future. This is a shape in a different space. It's qualia space. It's not the 3D space in which we live. C certainly. And it's the space of possibilities. C certainly, but you've located that qualia space, which is, which is not the connectome or anything like that, but you've located that in, in a particular uh, geographical area within the volume of, uh, of my brain. Yes. Does it's that mean be... that's, that's where the perception lies? It doesn't lie there, but it is generated by those physical mechanisms in space and time. Absolutely. So it lives in a different space, but the mechanisms that make it possible are in some particular place at some particular time. Yes.